So first of all, we need to look at the basics. And they really are basic. Simple things like being sure that your mount is fully aligned, if it's equatorial, if you've got good polar alignment, um, if it's an alt as, have you followed the correct instructions, aligned north, and doing, done all the things that uh, the manufacturer recommends to get good tracking and good alignment. Is your finder aligned? This is absolutely fundamental. Obviously, optical collimation, prime condition of your optics is important. I also believe it's very important not to overextend the tripod if you're working off of a tripod. You know, stability is king. Uh, you're not looking visually through the scope, so really the height of the scope above ground doesn't uh, make a big difference, but uh, it will make a big difference to the stability. Check that the site you're observing from is adequate for the object you want to uh, image. And my back garden, for instance, suffers quite badly from light pollution and, and there are certain objects that I just would never attempt to photograph. And is the sky going to be clear long enough for you to go through the process and get a satisfactory result? I've had many occasions when I've uh, set up only to suddenly find the image has disappeared from the screen and when I look up at the sky a cloud has appeared. And last but not least make sure you take the lens cap off and that includes removing any focus mask that you might be using. So let's consider what the challenge is. You need to understand and determine exactly what your equipment is capable of imaging. Things like aperture, focal length, guiding accuracy. Uh, these will all be part and parcel of this equation. So do your research and make sure that you're not trying to achieve something that is really beyond the capabilities of your particular equipment. And alongside this, be realistic about where you are in developing your skills. I mean, you've got to challenge yourself. You've got to move the thing forward, but one step at a time um, avoids a lot of disappointment. The main thing is to prepare for the task and develop a workflow that becomes very much second nature so that you do the right things time after time after time. And over time, you'll find that the job gets easier and easier and that you get good results on a more regular basis. This requires you to make friends with your computer. A lot of people don't like computers for some reason, but modern astrophotography is computer-based, so you need to master that relationship. And just practice, practice, practice. One thing to understand is that different types of mounts have very distinct capabilities and limitations. If you look at the old azimuth, you have this factor called field rotation. Because although it will track an object, the field that you're looking at will actually rotate because it's not following the curve of the heavens. So this will have a major impact on the exposure times. It's not generally an issue when you're photographing the moon or even certain exposures on the planets but for anything beyond that it becomes a big factor in life and this is where some sort of an equatorial mount is really beneficial because it counteracts the field rotation particularly if you're guiding as well and that's what allows for the sort of length of exposure that will uh, give great deep sky results, something which in all honesty I haven't done on a regular basis. So looking quickly at the DSLR, this is mine, sadly I'm a Nikon user, uh, this causes uh, some levels of derision from my Canon friends, but there we go. Um, you need to have the right lens and there isn't one right lens that if you want to go wide field of photograph the sky, the Milky Way, then you're going to need a uh, lens that gives you a wide field and a low f-stop. 
if you want to photograph something like the Andromeda, you're going to need a lens with, say, something like a 200 mil uh, range. So, you know, that make sure that this, the lens you have is matched to the task. An intervalometer is really good when you're taking sky shots. It allows you to control exposures and do it really on a hands-free basis. I use a wireless one. Uh, it's uh, proved very useful and uh, avoids yet another wire dangling from the scope. You obviously need an adapter to uh, allow you to connect the scope uh, to the camera or the camera to the scope. And the other thing I occasionally use is eyepiece projection, um, where I insert an eyepiece into this adapter. Uh, it gives a larger image than you would otherwise get on a, a DSLR. Um, and brings either greater crater detail into into range or possibly even the planets. The other thing I do is put my camera piggyback on my scope, which allows um, me to use the benefits of the scope to track the sky and allow longer exposures to be made. This is my planetary CCD. Not the most expensive in the world, it's a Celestron Next Image 5, but I have to say, by and large, I've been very pleased with it. Um, I've got a choice, and I actually use all three of these programs, but tend to favour uh, ICAP, I have to say. I mean, it's, it's probably the least complicated of the programs to operate. In a sense, it's also the least comprehensive. Um, and so I occasionally use SharpCap and I use FireCap. But these are the programs that will take the image from the camera and put it into your laptop in AVI form. It brings it through as a, as a movie, which you can then refine and generate a single frame of the highest possible quality. After the capture, you've obviously then got a process, and this is my workflow. I go through PIP, auto stack it, and then Registax. And we'll talk more detail on those as we go forward. Obviously, beyond this processing, you can get into image manipulation with the likes of Photoshop, which I favor, Lightroom, PixInsight, GIMP. Um, there, there are a number that are available. Some you have to buy, some you get free of charge, but uh, there you go. Look at image capture. One of the main challenges is how do I achieve focus? I favour the Bartenoff mask, but there's Hartman masks and other varies. I mean, obviously with the Bartenoff, what you're looking to do is get this nice clearly aligned spike from the interference pattern and that tells you that you're in focus. Uh, one thing that helps me greatly is that I have a motorized Crayford on the back end of my SCT which means that at least when I'm adjusting focus I'm not disturbing the scope uh, and that's a real boon. The other thing you can do if you haven't got a focus mask is use something like the limb of the moon. Um, that can be extremely good, both for photographing the moon, obviously, but also on occasions I will pick the moon up, achieve focus on the moon, and then move to a planet, uh, having achieved satisfactory focus. Obviously, with a DSLR, most modern DSLRs allow you to have live view. Um, you can enlarge the image, and that really does help you get better focus. There are also a number of laptop-based software programs that allow for remote viewing of your camera's live view uh, and even adjustment of exposure conditions through your laptop. Um, I have to say Canon are better provided for in this way than Nikon, but um, both cameras have some provision uh, and I, in fact, use uh, a couple of programs with my Nikon that, that are very satisfactory. With a CCD, the biggest challenge is to get the object in the middle of the field of view. Um, this is greatly helped if you have gone to the trouble of getting good alignment on your finder. 
at least uh, you've got some degree of certainty that the object you're looking for is in the field. Um, most capture software allows you to use a larger field of view um, in order to initially centralize, albeit that this will be a, a lesser frame rate. Um, and then you can move to a more refined, a smaller field of view, but with a higher frame rate for the actual imaging. You can also use factors like increased exposure or binning. Uh, binning is where you actually combine pixels to generate a brighter image and makes the object more easily identifiable on screen. Some people actually image with uh, a level of binning applied as well, um, particularly if you're using a uh, camera that is not ideal for deep sky, then binning will obviously be a benefit. Sharp cap and fire capture both feature various means of assessing your focus. Um, the image shown on screen is the contrast based focus measurement that, that SharpCap offers. Um, but there are other variants, some of which are based on the use of Bartonov masks. You should be aware that an out of focus image can be very large and is not always up on screen. This, this is not an exaggeration. In fact, very often it's worse than this and I have on occasions actually been so far out of focus that uh, I've been looking through the hole in the middle and you look at the screen and think there's nothing there. It's only when you move to better focus that you suddenly realize the thing's been there all the time. It's something to take from. We look at processing. I begin with PIP. PIP is very much the start of my processing workflow. Um, what it allows is to limit the number of frames you take forward to the best frames that are available within the Abbey that you've captured. Uh, it will then place them in sequence from best to worst. Uh, very usefully, it will also center a planetary image within the frame, or it will stabilize the area of interest on a lunar or solar image. So it does a good job of getting the Abbey into good condition to take forward for further processing. You can crop to a get given image size as well. It also shows processing uh, on a thermometer style process bar. Uh, so at least you know where you are within the process and, and usefully with PIP it tells you very clearly where it's then put the finished file. Um, and most of these programs in my workflow will, will accommodate it, just a drag and drop from one process to another. Auto stack it is broadly acknowledged as uh, being the better program for stacking. Um, it is very good in so much as it provides a detailed analysis of the quality of the frames. And if you've gone through PIP, it will put all the good frames on the left-hand side. Um, it will allow you to see how many frames are of an acceptable standard and make a, a, an intelligent decision as to how many frames you actually want to, uh, to take forward in the processing. It can apply sharpening to the image, although I've got to say, I'm not that impressed with this. I think it's over sharpened and uh, doesn't do a great deal for the final image. So I tend not to uh, take this sharp. Just to let you see that this is um, typically what an image would look like. This actually is not an image that went through PIP. You can tell that because the planet is not, Jupiter obviously is not in, in the center of the frame. Uh, it's not a particularly good image and it's moving about a bit. Um, but when we did an analysis, use the analysis function, you'll see immediately that there's very, very few decent frames available within this sequence. So actually, we reduced the uh, we reduced the number of frames. I took it down, in fact, to five percent, 
and from that 5% we uh, we got this result which you've got to bear in mind this is before it's through Registax so you know it will sharpen up further than this but given the start point it's really not a bad result um, and certainly uh, better than would have been achieved had we tried to process all the frames. Registax uh, can in fact do a stacking job itself and on occasions I'll do this just particularly for the, for the moon but um, in the main I stack in auto stack it and bring it into uh, Registax to utilize this function here, the wavelet function. The wavelet sharpen the image at various points within the tonal range and the detail range. It also gives you the capacity to add some noise and also add a little bit of sharpening. Um, it gives you functions like um, the histogram that will allow you to modify the tone curve that you normally find on planetary images, you get this little lump at the left hand side that, that you move the, the thing over and you, you then stretch the histogram to remove that and you get a much better image. But you can do things like align RGB, you can control saturation and you can adjust the gamma. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's just a really useful program that delivers outstanding results. You, you'll be amazed how much of an improvement you can achieve. And it is a real improvement. It's not about artificially changing the image. It's about bringing out what is actually there. And then usefully it allows you, once you've attained a setting that you like, it allows you to retain that as a scheme, which you can then apply quickly for future use. So here's the workflow as it stands. Uh, first of all, it's going to take a little while to get started. This is a, an Abbey of Mars, as you can see, but it will start. image retouching there's a number of packages that you can think of Photoshop is what I favor and have done for many years um, there's also a free package called GIMP um, it's a very comprehensive package and it will do almost everything you want it to do it's somewhat less intuitive I find than Photoshop and it has a couple of little quirks such as it will not save a file as uh, you have to export the file and tell it what format you want to export in. Um, but other than that, it certainly is a, a good package. Uh, and it has one or two features that, that actually are better than Photoshop. Um, so I will occasionally use it, but in the main it's Photoshop that I use. The package that is probably most comprehensive and which is the one that most advanced users seem to settle on is PixInsight. Um, it's particularly good, I think it's true to say, of deep sky objects. Um, it has all sorts of functions of deconvolution and things like that in terms of stars uh, and produces some outstanding results. It's a very complicated program and there's a very steep learning curve. Um, but those I know who use it and have mastered it um, speak very highly of it. And the most basic level... Um, there's Picasa, which is a Google freeware. Sadly, it's uh, likely to be curtailed fairly shortly, but um, it, it is a very good basic package if you want to sharpen an image, if you want to adjust contrast, if you want to 
uh, color adjust uh, as a number of functions that are very, very easily used and accessed. Um, and it's free. Um, so for the non-technical people who want just a very easy way of working, it's it's got some potential. So why do we retouch? These are my views that we should retouch to maximise the image quality but not falsify it. I think uh, there can be a tendency to over-egg the pudding as it were. It can bring out hidden detail and uh, show you exactly what your scope and camera have captured. You can enhance colour, things like the red spot here on Jupiter can be brought up a little bit in value um, within the range of what's natural and acceptable. It can remove faults if you've got a blemish on a lens or a contamination on a sensor, uh, you can take that out. And basic values like brightness, contrast, colour, saturation, they can all be done and, and the good thing is they can be done locally. They can either be done through a mask or even in some cases brushed onto the image um, which makes it very easy to do localised changes rather than having to do a general correction of the image. Just a quick look at some of the things I will perhaps regularly do. Um, colour saturation uh, th this is relatively subtle, I hope. Um, you simply pull the slider left and right to adjust the level of saturation. Very easy to overdo this, um, but as you can see here, just brought a little bit more colour into the disk of the planet. I also adjust luminosity. Uh, you do this by duplicating the actual image and then the second image that you've copied you convert from RGB to LAB and you take out the lightness value, the luminosity and reintroduce that using a mask into the original image and what you can see here is that I've just added a bit of luminosity to the rings and also to the equatorial belt um, it's a bit heavy-handed, but it's just to show exactly how this can be used. Um, the other thing you can do using masking and layer masking in particular is that you can isolate given areas. And what that allows you to do, as is shown here, is you can take that area of oscillate isolated and, and apply a localized correction. I mean, in this case on screen, uh, this is using the noise reduction function within the NIC collection in Photoshop. Um, and so it allows me just to re remove some noise within the disk of the planet without softening or changing the value of the rings. The mask itself has got a soft blur on it so that when it's recombined, it will remain looking quite natural. You can also, and this is a very straightforward factor, you can alter the tone curve. You can put a lock on uh, particular points within the tone curve so they remain consistent and then just pull up or pull down values in other areas on the tone curve. This is just a direct comparison. It, it, it's actually a little bit further than I would normally go in terms of planetary uh, retouching but it just shows that from the original to the final you can get a marked difference um, using uh, Photoshop or the other programs we mentioned. If you're interested in uh, learning more uh, these are two gentlemen I would highly commend. Um, I've used them both frequently and do frequently revisit their YouTube presentations they're both excellent. Uh, their presentation skills are excellent, um, better than mine, I would have to say, um, but really, really informative and a very wide range of videos covering many, many topics. So uh, I would commend these people as a point to go to for further interest. So that's the end of this small presentation. These are some of my little images. Um, still a long way to go. Uh, I've got a telescope uh, 
which has a great capacity. I don't think I'm within 10% of what it can deliver, um, but I'll need to invest in new cameras and invest some more time learning and developing techniques. As I've said here, uh, there's no doubt about it. If you get hooked on this one, it's a great opportunity to reduce your bank balance. Anyway, thank you for listening. Hope you have. And uh, look forward to uh, hearing some comments in the future.